بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم So today when we talk about spiritual abuse I don't want people thinking that we're talking about some phenomena going on going on somewhere else or with a group or with individuals that are easy to recognize as abusers. Spirit, the reason is spiritual abuse is covert most of the time, which means you won't detect it easily. Overt abuse, for example, is somebody coming and physically assaulting you. You know what happened, you were physically harmed. Covert abuse is undercover, you won't detect it. It's the difference between somebody robbing you and somebody uh, conning you scamming you for money in a slighted way. So spiritual abuse itself, uh, the term is used to describe abuse under the guise of religion, whether it's somebody using religious texts or using religious position for a personal gain or to harm somebody else. And this is a very common phenomena and inshallah today we'll get into more detail. So spiritual abuse abusers are often narcissists, but not necessarily, which means that the person, the perpetrator, does not have any moral breaks. What's wrong, what's immoral, the person who commits those actions doesn't feel that it's wrong. They understand rationally it's wrong, which is why they hide those actions. So they do get it, they do understand it, which is why they need to hide it, but they're not going to feel bad about it. And the reason to understand that there are people like this is so you don't engage with them the same way you would engage a person who doesn't have this lack of conscience. So the rules are different in terms of you have to be more assertive and you don't want to get bullied in interactions, which is very common when you call abusive behavior out. You'll be manipulated, the tables will be turned around on you, you'll be blamed for small things you did to justify larger transgressions and more serious transgressions that the individual did. So, in Islam, we go by something called Zahirul Adala, which is apparent uprightness. We don't investigate a person to see, you know, what's he doing wrong in private. We just see if this person is outwardly upright, meaning they're not, for example, drinking in public, they're not um, committing any sins or persisting in sins in public. Now, the person who has a Zahirul Adala, outward uprightness, may be much worse than somebody whose sins are apparent, but we won't know it. And this matters because when people ask for advice in terms of hiring somebody or in terms of marriage, they're not going to hear um, when they ask around that this person's actually abusive, this person might do something really bad, because the general public does not know. So when you have abuse in the religious context, most of the time, the general public does not know. And the way these cases work is the board of the masjid or the nonprofit or the institute, those people will know a lot of the times. And sometimes they won't even know because this is done in small communities and the people who are targeted are more vulnerable people. And I'll explain what that means uh, in a bit. So first I want to explain that spiritual abuse, um, it can cover different areas. Today I'm going to talk about in financial abuse, bullying, and illicit and uh, secret marriages. So to begin with money, you have uh, zakat in Islam, we all know that, and there's different categories of people who can accept zakat. One ambiguous or open-ended category is those in the path of Allah, fi sabilillah. Now most people when they give that, they're not assuming that this allowance for fisa bilillah will be misused by organizations, especially if it's advertised as helping students in need or as just helping poor people. But when you give zakat, a lot of these organizations will just use fisa bilillah for their own programming and they'll use it very irresponsibly. One example would be having um, a program where the speaker is paid maybe $100 to $200. Admission is normally $20, but they'll have a scholarship for people who can't afford it, and they can just arbitrarily set the price for those individuals at $1,000 a person. So those students are given zakat, the people whose uh, seat is sponsored, and it is zakat technically for them, according to this understanding. But then it goes back to the organization as revenue. 
So zakat becomes a funnel for the organization. Does that make sense? So again, this is not something people would accept and people would be upset if they learned that this is where their zakat is going. But it's a lack of transparency, which is why people won't know. And a lot of what's used is something called affinity fraud, which is people, organizations will use um, respected religious figures or even positive messaging that appeals to people as a way to solicit funds. So instead of explaining what happens with your money, they're just going to show videos of some student, maybe from an underprivileged background, learning and benefiting, or somebody showing excitedly how much they benefited, or just success, other success stories. And also um, other respected religious figures, them giving testimonials, and people won't think that anything could be wrong because it's trusted figures who are sponsoring this organization. And again, sometimes they know of the fraud. Oftentimes they're getting large cuts of this zakat as well um, as honorariums if they come and do events. And sometimes uh, they just know and don't care. So a lot of the people, uh, sorry, and then the next one would be bullying. So bullying is something that is there's more awareness being created now, even in sports and in workplace bullying. It's an epidemic really across society. And in the religious context, the way, some of the ways this works is through this idea of tzarbiya, of building a person. Now you can call it self-development, tzarbiya, whatever name you give it, this is a pervasive problem. Um, you'll see programs, for example, addressing needs. So these, these people, they'll, they'll address certain needs that are in the community and abuse their position uh, while they're fulfilling that need. So, for example, chivalry classes for young men, people who feel inadequate to be husbands, young men, they know they need more masculinity, and they're often abused in these type of classes and bullied, and they will initially accept it thinking this is what they need to do to develop character. And when the process is over, they oftentimes develop long-term PTSD and a very serious uh, distaste for religion. And also for women this happens. Sometimes we believe that being in the West we're inherently inferior in character, in adab, in moral strength to people from the East. So we forego everything we know to be true, everything we know to be abusive, just to learn something we believe we have no idea about. And this is where, where you'll see women being bullied a lot of times for uh, simple things that I don't even want to call them mistakes, but they can be labeled mistakes when you submit to the idea that you just don't know basic decorum, you don't know basic uh, social interaction. And again, this stuff, there will be a period generally where people go through it and they won't exactly catch what's wrong, and then the effects of it are really devastating afterwards. So a lot of times people will be involved in these religious groups in their early to mid 20s and in their late to, late 20s to early 30s religion or this being serious about religion was just some phase in their life and now they're done with it. And this is a very common scenario. Um, there's a lot of people who were beat as children in Quran schools or in madrasas and th this is actually the reason why a lot of people hate religious figures. And even on the topic of hitting, in a for people who would permit physical discipline, it's not something that equals child abuse. It's meant to be light reprimands. And that's why the peer review process is so important, so there's not actual child abuse. And it's also haram to do so if it's having a negative effect on the child. Even light, even with words, harsh reprimand, yelling, if it's having a negative effect on the child or an adult run, a learner, it's haram to do so. So the effect actually matters it has an impact on the action. So it can't be said to be from basira, from insight, from wisdom, when it's having an adverse effect on the recipient of that scolding. Um, also, um, in terms of uh, bullying, it's really critical to understand that when this happens to young adults, parents will often justify it. So if there's a teenager, someone in their 20s, even complaining or, or um, explaining something's wrong, that they're being treated poorly, 
you'll get a lot of justifications of, well, that's your teacher, respect your teacher, or your teacher knows best. And these are mindsets that people who run these programs, who exploit that need for development in young men and women, they're very well aware of. So they'll say things like, you know, we're living in Bajalic times, we need to raise children to be strong in the end of times, and this is how you build moral character. Or they'll even, when it's the parents who have issues with abuse or with bullying, they'll often say your parents, uh, if this applies, that your parents are from another country, they're from another time even, they're from a different culture, they don't understand what we're doing here. And that worldview is created for the person who is being targeted with this type of abuse to not have anyone to seek help from. So they'll be told, and this actually works on people, that um, you know, this is the people who are telling you this is wrong, they're coming from a very liberal paradigm, they don't, th their understanding is kufr, they don't understand that this is Islam, this is tarbiyah. And when you close people off from a larger peer review, it's very easy to do this. So that's on bullying and on secret marriages and haram relationships. So this is something that people will generally think more of um, when they hear of spiritual abuse because that's a little bit more popularized. It's Keep in mind it's one element and when it comes to relationships, uh, secret marriages, so first when it's actually done through marriage. Uh, to be clear, the marriages I'm talking about, they are exploitative marriages, meaning that people, a lot of these speakers traveling or religious figures will pick out women who are more vulnerable. And how do they know that? They'll often engage in conversations, for example, oh, what does your father think about you coming to these events? Oh, your father's not really around. You know, and kind of trying to gauge how many men are in that sister's lives. And the, or to see how the relationship is with her and other men in her family to see exactly what they could get away with. <clears throat> and and uh, in other cases, and this is not rare, the first wife of that person <clears throat> will help him pick out other women. And this will be in the cases of, uh, sorry, this will play out sometimes in inviting her over <clears throat> to their house and uh, them just hanging out, having a good time together showing them that this is potentially a good case of polygamy where everybody is just fun and happy. And when the relationship does end, and this is a secret marriage, meaning it's not legally registered and other people don't know. So there's no legal accountability and there's no social accountability. And without that accountability, there's no shame factor. This again is the private sphere and they can get away with it and there's no recourse. There's no legal recourse, there's no social recourse. So what will happen is, and, and the rights of the woman are withheld, the mahar is often withheld, and she's just divorced, sometimes just a simple text message. And then the first wife, in many cases, will gang up against the, this woman who was quickly divorced, saying, and uh, deny her claims that it was a secret marriage, saying, no, I knew about it, you're wrong, you were just mentally unstable, you just couldn't handle it. Um, we tried to tell you that this was a polygamous marriage, you weren't going to be living with us, but you just couldn't handle it. And when that happens, it doesn't have the form of misogyny. So the man, the husband, doesn't look bad as if he just did an immoral act. It seems like a good idea that just wasn't uh, viable or something they tried and something they failed in. So the claims of not getting her rights, there's no enforcement for that. And there can't be because there's no mechanism for that. And also, in other cases, um, sorry, just to pick out the vulnerability as well, a lot of times it'll be a teacher-student relationship and, or just events, volunteers at events, and they'll test how open the sister is to this idea. So they'll make comments like, oh, I had a dream of us getting married. That was weird. And just seeing what the reaction to that is. Or making jokes, sending articles about polygamy. Or very often the courting, it's not courting, but the really the exploitation, grooming process, um, sending articles about polygamy and even sending confusing messages. 
like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if all of, if we were just one family, and seeing how people react to that. And again, these are not meant to be serious marriages. They're short term, and this is more common than we realize, especially with people when they're traveling. Sometimes it's just different wives in different states and marriages that end in abruptly, and there's, again, no recourse. So when there is when this does become known and it's brought up to organizations, you get justifications for this type of abuse that nobody would justify before the actions are undertaken, but it's a retroactive justification. Why is that? Because a lot of times these people are high performers, meaning they're the speakers who sell the tickets and they're doing well. Sometimes they're the media darlings. Imagine if you lose a powerful voice um, especially when people are afraid about Islamophobia. Imagine if you invested in an Islamic center, your family grew up there, this is your social circle, and taking a stance against somebody means you're going to lose your social circle, you're going to lose your social network. These are not things people want to do. So the message that's sent is very clear now that these rules apply to you unless you're good enough. And if you're valuable, if you're an asset, then we'll let you slide and you can do whatever you want. And that's exactly the message that's been sent to this community, um, to North American community for decades. And it's been going on around the world since really the beginning of time. So these people, when they persist long enough, they become decades, they, sorry, after decades of work, they'll be called pillars of the community. They have a large, they have a track record of great work because they do good work. A lot of times these people are more motivated to come pray Fajr at the masjid, to lead youth programs, to give khutbahs than other people. And we know how it is in masajid. People, there's a shortage of speakers. There's a shortage of people who want to do youth events. But these people are, are more motivated. So they are assets to the community. And that's one of the confuse, confusing points for people that they also do a lot of good work. And they will, because they're motivated. So, you know, we're not here to make the case that somebody's evil or not. We're talking about actions. So actions have to go checked. So how do you check actions? And this really has to do with having a code of conduct, which we developed on In Sheikh's Clothing, which is uh, the website uh, that uh, me and a sister named Dania have for spiritual abuse. Um, it's a code of conduct we encourage organizations to have because without it, there really is no mechanism for accountability. And to give a few examples of that, if you hear of a teacher being in Khalwa, for example, with a woman, what does that mean to most people? Being alone in seclusion and the third person shaitan. Haram, but what, what does it mean to be alone? Right, but what I'm saying is there's a definition that's uh, in general understanding of just being alone, but then there's a very technical understanding, which means you could be alone in an office with the door open and there's a chance people will walk by and it won't be a uh, khalwa technically. So it's not the haram khalwa, but a lot of bad things could happen in those situations still. And they do happen and there's no witnesses to things when they happen. So... In those cases, um, when it is even brought up that, oh, this is what these people are doing, they're meeting in khalwa, it's justified as, well, it's not technically khalwa, right? So it's not, you, you can't pin it to anything wrong. And in real cases, um, when, a, when it was, there's no denial, it's, it comes to light and it's admitted that a person married a 16-year-old girl without her parents knowing. And it's not just without the parents knowing, it's guiding them away from telling their parents which again is showing that they don't have the girl's best interest in mind uh, because they're guiding her away from her wali. What's the response from other female religious leaders and male religious leaders? She's an adult in Sharia. If she reached adulthood through her cycle, even if she's 15 or 14, she's an adult, and it's the same whether she's 14 or 30 years old. She made her decision, we can't say that this was wrong. And this really happens, but again, it's in private cases. Right, but this, so this is the point, that when it's a retroactive justification, people will find anything to justify. 
and there's no mechanism of enforcement. So there's no privileging strong Sharia views or dominant Sharia views over uh, minority uh, Sharia views. There's, it's, uh, it's the Wild West because there's no enforcement mechanism. And when there's motivation to justify all courses of action, you could do it very easily through mental gymnastics. And that's exactly how it happens. And another example, when there's even, because uh, some, some cases like the, the person will touch women um, or on their shoulder, on their hijab, and it'll be complained like he's touching us. What's the response? Well, it's not skin to skin. And again, this is not something people would ever advocate. In the youth halakas, I mean, this would never be said. But once it happens, there's a retroactive justification that's only used retroactively. And it's used um, selectively as well. So again, it's the Wild West. Anything could happen. Um, and also, when things happen in private, there's often a shortage of evidence. So it's difficult to get people uh, to prove that the exact allegation is what happened. So in the code of conduct, if you just outline that a man and a woman cannot be alone in this office, even with the door closed at this time, then you can uh, hold people accountable for the precursors to bad action, not necessarily the allegation if there's not enough proof for it. So if there's an abuse that happens on a car ride alone, which happens, you know, the teacher or the figure will pressure uh, somebody to just take the car ride, a car ride home with them, even if they feel uncomfortable. The justification is it's not a big deal, it's not khalwa, it's not seclusion in Sharia because there's windows to the car. We'll, we're not going to be in some alley. People are going to see it. So the fault there would be being in a car alone or giving a right to a student. That should be outlined as inappropriate. And these might these. Things do seem like common sense, but nobody realizes how important they are until there's an issue. And these issues are going around all, all in communities all around America, North America, UK. This is a really, really big problem. So my advice is really to not engage in um, activities and in institutions until there is a code of conduct. Don't donate until there is financial transparency. This is not to make an accusation. We're told in the Quran to write down transactions and if you loan people money. This is precaution that we're supposed to exercise. And we know that we don't have, in many Muslim cultures, you just have urf. Things that you'll call it good or bad based on what's known and uh, cultural norms. Ideas of aib, that's just wrong. But in America, part of the reason is diversity different madahib, different uh, Islamic cultures that come together. And some are more conservative, some are less conservative. And you don't have a clear black and white understanding of cultural norms here because of the diversity, which makes it very easy for people to manipulate that gray area because that's what manipulators do. They take advantage of and exploit gray areas. And um, it's easier to be evidence-based as well when there is when, when right and wrong is outlined and drawn out clearly. So there's a hadith, لو يعطى الناس بدعواهم لدعى رجالون أموالكم ودماءهم That if people were given in accordance to their claims, people would claim the, the blood and money of other people. لكن البينة على المدعي واليمين على من أنكر But the Burden of proof is on the one making an accusation, and the oath is on the one who's being accused. Meaning that we are an evidence-based religion, and a lot of times that's the reason, of course, why perpetrators will get away. But we want to ease that process of just outlining smaller wrong actions, so there's an easier way of holding people accountable. And again, this goes back to the idea of zahirul adala and judging by the outward that a lot of actions will not be, if there's no proof, you cannot expect accountability. So this builds up um, frustration in people that this person did something so wrong to me, but nothing was ever done. And the reason, again, a lot of it goes back to there's no mechanism of, mechanism of accountability. And that's exactly what a code of conduct would allow. So also, um, 
Sheikh Khalil al Nahlawi in his uh, Hadar wa Libaha, a text on it has disease of the heart and some thick in it. He mentions also that deep seated resentment is often a result of oppression not being addressed. So when people have been wronged for a long time, or have been wronged and there's no redress, they develop envy, like wanting that person to lose um, good things in their life. It leads to people slandering other people or backbiting and insulting that person because they, they got no recourse. So it's better for everybody, it's better for people's um, attachment to the religion to show that even if somebody is very successful, even if somebody is um, selling tickets for us, even if somebody is producing great results in the community, we're not going to make exceptions for them. Wrong is wrong no matter who does it. And that's a message we really need to send because this is a reason a lot of people end up leaving Islam or leaving um, Islamic circles and just become marginal Muslims. And this is a powerful message to send. I've had a lot of people, alhamdulillah, reach out and just say from what we've seen on the website, it's given me a lot of confidence in this religion and it's uh, been a blessing to see a Muslim address this because up until this point I was just told by everybody that I have no proof or just to have a good opinion or just to be patient and to let it all go and or just the perpetrator's act good was just pointed out. So this is the message we need to send and inshallah um, I would just again advise people to push for masajid and organizations to have some system of clear outlines of what's right and wrong because it is the gray areas that are exploited. It's not a clear halal and haram. So now I do want to go over a few signs of spiritual abuse, some precursors and something to look out for. And these signs are not uh, comprehensive, but here are a few key ones. One, if a teacher lies about an ijazah, you don't need anything else after that. If a person could lie about having license from a sheikh to take on spiritual disciples or to impart knowledge, and you found that out to be a lie, that lie is enough for you to stay away from that person. Um, practically speaking, even when this happens, there's excuses made. Um, people will just say, well, what if he interpreted he got an ijazah and he's just wrong or he just felt like he should say that? So again, it's very easy if you're not emotionally connected to that teacher, but once you are, people will make all sorts of excuses. Um, another sign would be doing clear haram um, persistently that you should probably stay away from this person. But again, practically speaking, when people are emotionally invested in teachers, have spent long times in their, a long time in their service or benefiting from them, or they just do programs with them and this person's a social asset for, for you, it's very easy to justify saying things like only the prophets are perfect, which is what everyone believes, but it's said as an excuse. Or, well, I'm not sinless, so I don't want to point out anything about this person. So those kind of, again, retroactive justifications. Um, and exploiting gray areas, I mentioned that before, but let me explain it a little bit more things that would never be done publicly or advocated for publicly as wrong as when people will say like it's wrong even if it's not haram um, such as hanging out and joyriding like just a single man and a woman together but doing that privately systemic, uh, systematically. So those are signs of exploiting gray areas. Also um, use appeals to wisdom Again, going from something tangible, a criterion everybody has access to, um, matha positions, Quran, hadith, a normative transmitted Islam, to just the sheikh's wisdom. Or a dream I saw. And again, if you're imagining some weird person dancing that you have no connection to, you might think you'll recognize it right away. But try to think how this may apply to somebody you do trust, somebody that has a very normal appearance who, this, who justifies actions in this way. Not justifies, not just, you know, like mundane actions, but actions that are very questionable or abusive by dreams. Um, also just feelings and visions. 
um, I had a dream with the Prophet Sallallahu or Sayyidina Hussein or somebody that you need to donate money for the Zawiya. This stuff is very common. It, it really happens. And a lot of times the people who are victims of this type of spiritual manipulation of sheikhs in spiritual groups, whether it's in a tariqa or outside of it, are very learned individuals. People who teach fiqh, people who teach tafsir, have studied 10, 15 years, and they're the ones manipulated by one spiritual sheikh. And I get a lot of outreach by such figures. And they, their embarrassment is very different because they say, we've taught against this. You know, we used to teach people that the first thing in Sharia, in, in Tasawwuf, is you have to follow the Sharia. That tariqah doesn't exist outside of Sharia. These were people who publicly taught this and they still fell for it when it happened to them. And the shame and embarrassment those individuals feel, it's, it's just very hard to express. I mean, sometimes they'll call just to scold themselves to me. And again, this isn't going to necessarily be public because of the shame attached to it. Right. Um, also, and this ties into financial as well, one common um, in, in the Sufi Tariqas is when, and again, not just Sufi Tariqas, but close-knit groups is people will say, we need to buy a Zawiya, we need to buy an Islamic, a Dawa center. And the money, because there's long-standing trust of the Sheikh with other students who might also be, very, might also be called Sheikh, very respected figures, there's no there's no financial accountability. It's all just personally sent, sent money. And then that Zawiya, that Islamic Dawah Center, ends up becoming personal property of that religious leader. And no one saw it coming because they trusted the person so much. And um, another um, sign would be if a group or if a teacher is pushing absurd beliefs as spiritual. So the more you can believe in something outrageous, the more spiritual you are. This is also common. It's like a test of your spirituality. How deep are you in hakika? Can you believe something without any evidence, without any proof? And then sometimes it becomes a contest. Like, yeah, I believe a wali could do this. I believe that, you know. <laughs> and it's not just possibilities. It's, it's, it's really saying, apply that to me now. <laughs> you know, it's not, just, it's not theoretical or historical about Olia. Um, and, and it transitions then to people saying they're talking to angels, they're talking to the souls of people who have passed away. And again, we could say this is logically conceivable, but you don't need to apply it to every person claiming this. You know, that's, that's really where it becomes a problem. Just something historically may have happened or this happened in certain cases and it's applied now to everybody as if this is just a common thing, as if people walking on water is just a normal thing. Um, Another example would be putting down knowledge or studies. If somebody, if a religious figure, if a teacher, someone you're engaged with is putting down studies and knowledge as a veil to spirituality or saying you're wasting your time studying, you should focus on just developing yourself spiritually and that again is doing what I tell you, that's a big bright red flag. Anyone who puts down knowledge is not your friend. Um, another example would be spiritual explanation for events. Somebody gets into a car accident, something bad happens. Oh, he was speaking ill of me. Of course that was going to happen. What did you expect? You speak ill of the Oliya, Allah declares war on you. You don't think he was going to get in a car accident? I mean, this is exactly the kind of conversations that happen behind closed doors, and it scares people. So, and again, this, don't think of a very naive person don't think of somebody who doesn't, hasn't studied Islam. This works on all tiers. It's very powerful. And you just have to be very fortified in understanding that that's ilm al ghaib this is, this is knowledge of the unseen. Only prophets were revealed, uh, were, given, were given insight into that. Um, then spiritual threats, excommunication. If you disobey me, you have Surah Khatima, you're going to die in a state of kufr, you're not going to die in Islam, you're damned to hell, or you're going to have other tribulation. And again, this is common, you just won't see it in public. Sometimes we'll catch videos of this actually, but it's usually done in private. Um, now, and I think this is more important, is what should you do and what are signs that you're a target, you're prey, you're vulnerable to this?
So the number one thing, if I had to summarize, is just be assertive. If you, if somebody is touching you, interacting with you with words in a way that you're not comfortable with, you don't need a shari justification for it. Don't get into legal debates. Just say, I don't care if this is halal, I don't care if you do this, I don't care if I'm like a daughter to you, or I don't care if we're close enough for this to happen. No one touches me like that. That's the one thing that will put that person in a state where they understand they can't do that to you that it's immediately reacted to. And, and I do want to mention that um, when we're talking about illicit actions, there are also um, several cases of male figures sexually assaulting male other figures. Sometimes through ruqiyah, which is like a, like a ruqiyah, like a, like, like um, blessing the per person, sometimes exorcism, yeah, like reciting incantations, things like that, and you know, inappropriate touching in that way. So, and then that gives the person a dilemma as well, especially if this person's married, do they expose this person has like other tendencies, you know? And again, that empathy for the perpetrator is a lot, of, is another reason why abuse continues in many, many ex examples. So, back to being assertive. So, if you lend somebody money, do you feel uncomfortable asking for it back? Is it awkward for you to bring it up? If so, don't lend people money. You have to have that assertiveness to, to ask. It's your haq, it's your right. And that's the beauty of Islam. We have God-given rights. You're not overstepping your bounds. If somebody does something wrong to you, you have your rights to seek redress. Um, and especially with money, it's, 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 it's your right. <laughs> Don't be shy to exercise your rights. Um, also, um, signs, now signs that you are a, a potential target and that you're more vulnerable if you trust someone, if you trust that you, give, you giving money to someone will go to the right cause without seeing a transparent process. I mean, that's really, really important, and this applies to a lot of people. If you let the personality, the good work somebody does, mean more than a process, there's a good chance you'll be taken advantage of financially. If some... Um, if you're making excuses for someone disrespecting you, if you're saying maybe this person doesn't know what they're doing, maybe they're overall good, maybe they don't mean it in that way, and it's continual, not just a one-off, not, you know, this, you know this person to be very good, but just had a bad day. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about really targeting you to break you down, to hurt your feelings, to publicly humiliate you. If you're trying to justify that or are uncertain about why someone's doing that and you're more busy psychoanalyzing the person, then understanding it's wrong, then it's, it's likely to continue. Um, another is you believe in safe spaces. You believe that there are safe people in this world or people are generally safe. You going to a masjid, listening to a religious talk, a sermon, a youth halakha, a program for training the youth, those are not safe spaces. Uh, to explain what a safe space is, a place where you can just let your guard down, um, something that's encouraged in these circles is to share your vulnerabilities, share some trauma you may have experienced. Sometimes people are literally asked to share abuse stories with them. And what happens, again, not all the time, but in certain, in, it's more than common than we realize. In many cases, there are people taking note of this to, to map out emotionally who you are and what your weak points are. And that will be used against you in the future. They'll know exactly how to manipulate you. In one example, a religious figure um, kissed a woman against her will and touched her inappropriately, tried to marry her. She didn't want to marry him. And what he did was he used family history she confided in him earlier about some family dysfunction against her to her family. And he beat her to that, so she, he began the slander and smear campaign before she could say anything. And this stuff is very common, using symptoms against people, using mental health, uh, a, mental health issues in someone's past against that person to say, oh, they're just crazy. So these aren't things you want to disclose to people that you don't know very well. Um, so yeah, people are people, they're fallible. Always keep central to your belief that these people are fallible. Not just in a, not just aqidah wise saying only the prophets are infallible, but in your actual belief system that you act on. 
So if you ever catch yourself saying, for example, how could this person do it? He's the Imam. And you understand the behaviors were carried out, those actions you witnessed. You saying, but he's an Imam, is an indication that you actually believe being an Imam means he can't do these things, therefore meaning he's infallible. So really internalize that people are fallible. Another example would be that you will defer judgment on what you see to another religious figure. So if you see something happening, if you know you're being mistreated, it'll mean more to you what another religious figure or somebody you trust says. You're going to seek validation. And that should mean, if, if, if you know your experience and someone is praising this figure, it shouldn't mean anything to you. It could be they're praising that figure because they're partners in crime, which often happens, or the person only sees good from that person. Either way, it's not like a testimony to every single thing that person does. And it shouldn't have any bearing on what you uh, know to be true. Um, if you, lastly, um, yeah, also if you're confused by the person also doing good works. This happens sometimes, thinking that Allah only allows good people to do good things or good to come from good people. That's not our belief system. We have a hadith about a person uh, of a shaykh teacher going to hell and his students are going to heaven. And he's saying, and the students are saying, how are you going to hell when we only benefited from what you taught us? He said, I called, and he'll say, I called to good, but I didn't practice it. So benefiting from somebody, someone's good works, is not a proof of that person. Um, another, and this is pretty common, is apologizing when you haven't done anything wrong. If you're that type of person, predators will see it, and they will exploit it. So don't apologize if you haven't done anything wrong. And another uh, example would be that you'll excuse um, bad behavior based on the status of somebody that does it you'll accept that you're inferior, you're no one to question what somebody of high status is doing. And these are all very important, not just for yourself, but also if you have these qualities, you're very likely also to marginalize somebody else who's being victimized, who's being targeted, because you'll make those justifications for that person being abused. So keep this in mind, inshallah. And again, the, the way that we hold, that we make gray areas more solid is through spelling it out. And I encourage everybody to push for that when you engage in groups. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Okay, so I want to start off with some headlines of high profile cases that we've seen in recent years. Um, in all of these cases, you have people who are very highly regarded in the community, uh, people who are very respected and beloved by um, children and adults, and they've committed the most heinous and horrific crimes. Okay, thanks. I'm starting off with this information to show that the threat to our children can come from people that we love and respect and admire, and that at times they can actually use that admiration and love to exploit our communities. So as you can see, I have information up there about um, the Boy Scouts, which is an extremely popular uh, organization in the U.S. Um, Jerry Sandusky, who um, was guilty of dozens of child sex abuse charges across many, many years. The Catholic clergy, uh, we always see cases on the news about um, new clergy that are accused of crimes and cover-ups within the Catholic Church. Larry Nassar, which is probably the most recent case um, to come up, and he was the um, perpetrator who was accused of molesting U.S. gymnasts, again, for many, many years. And then there are also cases of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, again, another religious organization um, where child abuse was rampant, and it was also covered up. So um, this chart sums up one of the most important pieces of information I want to share here today. If you are going to come away with anything, I want you to at least come away with this. Um, as you can see, contrary to what most people believe, most, um, most perpetrators are known to the victim and they're not strangers. You know, we tend to think that um, ch perpetrators are, you know, weird looking men who are kind of lurking in playgrounds or schools. Um, but that's actually not the case. 93% of the time, they're known to the victim. 34% of the time, they're family. So, you know, parents, uncles, cousins. Um, 
and then 59% uh, are acquaintances, so that could be friends, teachers, nannies, babysitters, organization leaders, um, all kinds of people that are known to the victims, and only 7% are strangers. So here are some important facts I also wanted to share. Uh, according to research, one in five girls and one in 20 boys is a victim of child abuse. Now, I know that this, these, are, these figures are alarming, but I also want people to take into account that a lot of abuse cases go unreported because some kids don't never disclose. Um, and even if they do disclose, a lot of families don't report to the authorities. So the numbers could actually be much higher, and I've seen research that points to higher figures. Uh, the most vulnerable ages are between 7 and 13. Nearly 40% are abused by other kids. Um, so they could be friends, classmates, cousins, any other children, basically. And interestingly, also, 40 to 80% of juveniles who commit crimes such as this are victims themselves. 60% of victims never tell anybody. We're going to talk about um, the reasons why that is um, in a few minutes. And then, of course, um, people tend to think that uh, sexual abuse is only a contact crime, but that's not the case. So it could be any kind of behavior that is um, sexually motivated for the perpetrator. So it could be um, watching the child undress, showing the child inappropriate material, um, exposure to the child, anything that would be inappropriate in that sense would still be child abuse. And then most sex offenders do deny their crimes. I wanted to mention this because if a child makes a disclosure and you're, you're automatically thinking, well, I'm going to go ask the person that's being accused, you go and ask that adult, and the adult says, oh, no, that's ridiculous. It was a misunderstanding. Of course nothing happened. I want you to really think twice about trusting the accused over the child, because the vast majority of allegations are actually true, and most sex offenders deny their crimes. So I just want everybody to keep that in mind. Something else I really wanted to address was myths around child abuse. And I think the most prominent one really is stranger danger. So we spend a lot of time teaching our kids to be cautious around strangers, don't talk to strangers, don't take anything from strangers. The famous, you know, don't take candy from a stranger. We don't really teach them how to handle unwanted interactions from people they know, or people they love even. So, you know, most people have this idea that a sex offender looks, you know, unusual or different, but it's actually rarely are they strangers. So we have to make a point to teach our kids to set boundaries and be um, comfortable saying, no, this is making me uncomfortable, I don't want to be around that person, whether they're a stranger or not. We also think that children won't remember if they're abused at a young age or they're just going to get over it because they're so young, but that's actually not the case. Uh, the effects of abuse last for many, many years and well into adulthood, um, and it can impact various areas of a person's life. We'll discuss that in more detail as well. On the other hand, just because a child was abused doesn't mean that they're going to be, you know, distraught or struggling for the rest of their lives. A lot of factors play into um, how a child recovers from trauma, and that includes, you know, believing the child, family support, getting treatment, all kinds of other factors play into that. And then um, it's also unfortunate that you know, a lot of people assume that boys are rarely abused and that they think that it's mostly girls. But I talked earlier about um, the, that it's actually one in 20 boys, and it's probably even higher than that. And boys can be uh, abused by boys and girls, men and women. It's actually estimated that 14% of cases of uh, child abuse against boys are committed by women. And it's also assumed that if a mother is around that nobody can harm her child, but there have been also cases where, especially if it's someone that's trusted within the family, that the abuse is happening in the same room where the mom is. Um, so again, making sure that we're not thinking about the danger as just coming from strangers, but it could come from anybody within the family or community. We also want to believe that a parent um, can tell if their child is being abused or that the child is immediately going to tell them if they have a close relationship. But again, various actors play in, factors play into that. Um, you know, some kids never tell at all. Some kids wait months or years before telling. 
Uh, a lot of them think that you know they're embarrassed about it. Um, they think no one's going to believe them. They don't want to get the person in trouble, especially if it's someone that's beloved by the family, a family member or um, someone that the family respects. Um, they're afraid that their parents aren't going to love them anymore. Um, they're afraid that uh, they're going to be taken away by child services. Um, sometimes the children even deny the abuse, even when there's evidence that it happened, because they're afraid of all the, the possible repercussions. The other thing also is that perpetrators can play into that. So they can threaten kids that those are the things that would happen to you if you disclose. So then they're not going to tell anybody. And the other side of that that I wanted to address is that there are, uh, you know, parents that I think actually the majority of parents, when, when a kid comes to them and discloses something like this, the initial reaction is denial. No one wants to, to hear that their child suffered something so horrific. Um, so it's actually a very, very common reaction. And the most important thing to remember is in those kind of situations, it's understandable that you would be in denial at first. And what matters really is that you quickly realize that you have to trust your child and take immediate steps to make sure that they're safe. And so even if a, a mom initially says, what, that's ridiculous, there's no way that happened, it doesn't mean that they're a bad parent. It's actually a normal first reaction. Also, sometimes the abuse is minimized. So I know some behaviors seem worse than others, um, but it's important to remember that for a child, abuse is abuse. It's not about, um, you know, only in, for adults um, is, uh, sex considered intercourse. But for children, it's not about that at all. It's not about the physical act. It's about um, the betrayal. It's about um, the emotional aspect of it, that there was manipulation and deceit and that their innocence was stolen. That's what stays with them. That's what's the most damaging. It's not about the physical act. So, you know, we shouldn't say things like, well, he only touched, you know, her, her arm, or at least he didn't rape her and, or him. Um, because that's not helpful. That's not what stays with the child. <clears throat> Another thing I want to see here, and what uh, Brother Donish was saying as well, is that we want to believe that people in helping professions would never do something like this, uh, would never harm children. But research has actually shown that there are some offenders that choose their profession, especially because it gives them access to children. So there are many clergy and teachers and people in childcare who've said, yes, I went into this profession because I have access to kids and no one would question me. So it's important to not assume that just because somebody is a Quran teacher or you know the, the best babysitter in the neighborhood that you should dismiss any concerns that are brought to your attention. And then lastly, um, I think this is a pretty common myth that sex offender treatment doesn't work um, and that we should just you know lock up all sex offenders and they're all the same. Um, and the treatment is useless for them. That's not the case. There are different types of sex offenders. Um, some of, a lot of them actually are individuals who suffered their own traumas when they were kids, um, and they're dealing with, with um, their own histories of victimization, and f some of them feel a lot of remorse for their actions and want help. Now, some don't feel that way and are just predatory, um, but either way, treatment is very important, and it's an extremely important component in prevention. And I'm, I'm saying this here, because if you do come across someone that you personally or professionally know and they've committed a crime like this um, and you're hesitant about addressing the issue and you know you don't want to embarrass them they tell you oh I'll never do it again it was just one time and I don't know what I was thinking so you're thinking about just letting it slide and not reporting to the authorities I want you to really think about the importance of treatment in this case um, they need to be referred for treatment and treatment is not all the same. Um, I work in a treatment program, and um, it's individualized based on the person's history, based on their own experiences, based on their risk level. So I strongly want to encourage everybody to, to really think about that if you ever come across someone who is in this situation. And this is what we need to do for the good of the community and to protect our children, really. And you know, sending them off to another place or marrying them off, that's not going to help anybody. It's not going to help them. It's going to probably put other people in harm's way. Um, so the best thing to do in that situation is to report and um, recommend treatment. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about grooming. Uh, Brother Danish mentioned it a little bit. Um, so grooming really is the process where by a perpetrator gains access to a victim. To a victim. Um, it involves an imbalance of power, it involves coercion, manipulation, and the motivation is to get to the victim and to maintain that relationship. Um, and it involves not just the child, it involves the child's caregivers, it even sometimes involves the entire community. So I'm going to go through the steps in, um, involved in grooming. So the first step is identifying and targeting the victim. So the most vulnerable kids uh, for child abuse are kids that come from broken homes, kids who um, single parent homes, kids who are neglected, um, kids who you know they're um, they're not getting a lot of attention at home. They have really you know very busy parents, children with disabilities, children who are quiet. Um, reserved, shy, more passive. So those are the kids that are preyed on um, more often. The next step is gaining trust and access to them. So once the perpetrator identifies the, vic the potential victim, then they, you know, they pay special attention to them. Um, they buy them gifts, they buy them food, um, they buy them stuff that, you know, they're lacking at home. And they also offer emotional support. So, you know, they lend a sympathetic ear. If there's, there, you know, if there's stuff going on at home, then they listen to them and they offer them love and support and guidance. And gradually, what's happening is that they're playing a role in the child's life. Um, so they make the child feel like they're the only one that understands them, they're the only one that's supporting them and is going to be really there for them. And with time, what, um, what they end up doing is isolating the child. So they offer them rides, you know, they get drop-offs after school, they take them out for uh, meals, um, they take them to, you know, um, sports games, um, they give them personal lessons, so you know, individualized lessons, so they could tell the parents, "Oh, he's such a special kid, or she's such a, such a special kid." Um, I want to give them, you know, personalized lessons just by themselves to to grow their um, gift. So then they end up having a lot of alone time together, and of course, the parents are none the wiser; they don't know exactly what's going on. And at that point, nothing inappropriate has happened. This is again a process where they're slowly desensitizing the victim and the family to the idea of being alone with the child. Um, and then throughout all this, they're creating secrecy. So you know, they're they're telling the child, um, "Don't tell anybody about our relationship," and you know, "You're so special." You know, "Don't tell anybody about how you know we care for each other and that I'm there for you." Because if you tell, then all of that's going to go away, and we won't be able to go to all these games, and we won't have that special time, and I can't get you gifts and all that stuff. Now, what happens after this is gradually they start to initiate physical contact. And it doesn't immediately have to be something inappropriate, but it could be, or sexual, but it, what happens is, for example, like Jerry Sandusky, what he used to do was um, he would like gradually touch the boy's legs and then they would wrestle, you know, wrestling first with clothes and then wrestling, you know, with underwear and then um, showering with the boys. So, you know, he is a coach. so. Showering in locker rooms was normal for the boys, but then they, he would shower just with one of the boys. So it's gradual, 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 so that the kids are desensitized. So that finally, when he does make the uh, an appropriate sexual contact, the child isn't going to be as shocked, um, and uh, and will be less likely to say no. Now, in order to maintain this relationship, the the uh, perpetrator is instilling fear in the child because they, they need to control them. So they tell them, you know, if you ever tell anybody, there no one's going to believe you. Um, you know, it's, their, it's your fault because you wanted to be with me and you enjoyed, uh, you know, our trips together. And the, the problem is that why this is so incredibly damaging for kids is because the child is enjoying part of this, because, because the perpetrator is making sure that they are. Because the more that the child seems like they're enjoying this experience of you know, going out together, the gifts and the food and the games, um, then the less likely the child's going to say anything, the less likely anyone's going to believe anything is going on. Because the child seems like they're having a great time. And the child themselves are having a good time, really. So then they're struggling with this idea of, well, but this person, look, they love me and they're helping me and they're the only one in, in my life that cares about me, but they're hurting me. So they're struggling with this awful um, dilemma. And then the perpetrator feeds off of that and contributes to it. 
Now, I also want to say that this is not common in all cases. It, it's, um, in some scenarios, this doesn't happen at all. Um, and there's just coercion and fear. It doesn't have to be any grooming. Um, but again, this is such an important thing to think about because, you know, we, um, perpetrators are, are not, they don't have to be someone who's, you know, scary and, um, you know, it's a one-time thing it, um, and the child is going to tell right away. And I think that's what everybody has, most people have in their mind that that's what's going to happen, but that's not the case. And with people that employ grooming, it's so incredibly dangerous to our community because these are the people that seem like they're wonderful. I mean, everybody loved Jerry Sandusky. They thought he was the most amazing guy looking after all these troubled children, created an after-school organization for troubled kids. Everybody loved him. Um, and these people make sure that the community thinks that about them because that's going to get them more access. And if anybody says anything, no one's going to believe them. So they have access for a much longer time. They get away with whatever they want. So it's incredibly dangerous. So how do you know if your child is being abused? So there's um, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is normal versus abnormal behaviors, um, sexual behaviors. So um, I'm not going to talk about it by developmental stages, but typically, really what you should be thinking about is what's normal for my child's age. And to help, to get help with that, the best thing to do is to talk to your pediatrician or primary care physician to figure out, okay, you know, my child's acting this way, is that normal for their age? Um, but just kind of general ideas uh, are, you know, can they be redirected? If they're doing something inappropriate and you keep telling them to stop and they're not stopping it, that's concerning. If they know, you know, knowledge that's inappropriate for their developmental stage, that's also concerning. Um, if they're stimulating um, inappropriate adult acts, that's also very concerning because where did they learn that from? Um, if they manipulate other children to, you know, to abuse the children or having another child abuse them, that's also inappropriate and concerning. Um, if they're talking in an inappropriate manner, um, if being around other adults is, um, causes them excessive agitation, um, anything like that, that's all abnormal behavior. And then um, STDs also are a big tell. So um, if a child um, has an STD, then that's uh, obviously concerning because where did they get that from? And then, um, of course, mental health symptoms. So, you know, if they're withdrawn, if they're they seem that, you know, they're afraid, they're depressed, um, a suicide attempt, um, they're very angry and rebellious. Um, for no reason, right? So think about developmental stage. Is this appropriate for their developmental stage or not? Um, and then witnessing, of course. If it was witnessed, then you um, that's evidence. Using alcohol or drugs at an early age. So alcohol and drugs or you know, substances in general are um, commonly used in victims of trauma. They're, coping, they're unhealthy coping mechanisms. So if that's used, then that's concerning as well. And then chronic physical symptoms, you know, like stomach pain, headaches, um, and then with regards to physical findings, so a lot of people think that if a child is abused, then there's going to be physical findings and, like, and that's the way to tell if something happened. That's not the case. Actually, kids heal much faster than adults. So in a lot of cases, even with, you know, terrible abuse, there, there are no physical findings. They do a checkup and there's nothing there. So if you're going to rely, if you have other evidence and the physical findings seem to point like to the um, effect that nothing happened, I would not go with the physical findings because uh, they're actually uncommon. And then lastly, disclosure. If there is disclosure, you want to investigate. So effects on children. So I, um, I split this into short-term and long-term effects. Um, and I do want to say beforehand that, you know, sometimes um, the events that happen after the abuse can be as damaging to the kids as the actual abuse itself. So, you know, for example, not being believed um, having to go through the legal system, um, all of that can be re-traumatizing. And in fact, sexually abused children who tell and are not believed, or who never tell at all, um, are at greater risk of emotional, um, social, and physical problems that can go well into adulthood. Um, now, short-term short effects include regressive behaviors, which basically means that they're um, they're displaying behaviors that are not appropriate for their developmental stage. So, like, um, you know, thumb sucking, bedwetting, um, uh, you know, if they stop talking. So, like, you know, like a six-year-old acting suddenly like a two- or three-year-old. Um, 
sleep disturbances, eating problems, they, you know, they stop doing well at school, they don't want to go to school, they failed all their classes, they don't want to hang out with their friends. Those are all um, effects and signs. Long-term effects include substance abuse, as I mentioned earlier, that's a common um, coping mechanism. Dissociation, which means um, basically uh, kids who experience trauma, especially this kind of trauma, um, can, because of how uh, incredibly overwhelming the experience is, they can uh, emotionally detach themselves from the situation. So they might, may not even have memories of the abuse because it's so incredibly traumatizing. And this is especially true in cases of incest. Um, other mental health symptoms include depression, anxiety, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide attempts, eating disorders, physical health problems. So adults with a history of a child abuse are 30% more likely to have a serious medical condition like diabetes, cancer, heart problems, stroke, and hypertension. So as you can see, it's extremely damaging um, throughout the lifespan. And then, of course, they could have difficulties in their relationships and, you know, adult relationships. They can feel anger at the abuser, anger at their families for not protecting them, and anger at themselves because they felt like they could have been able to stop the abuse. And then finally, um, uh, research has shown that uh, someone who was victimized is highly likely to be re-victimized again. So they're likely to be traumatized again. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that now here, but if anybody has a question about this in the Q&A, I will gladly explain that phenomenon. Okay, so what to do to protect your child from abuse? So you want to carefully screen the people you, that are in contact with your child. Don't assume that just because, you know, they're high standing in the community that they're automatically safe at all. We want to make sure, you know, any, um, any uh, gut feeling you have, any doubts you have, you want to go with that. Um, don't ignore suspicious behavior. Um, again, if, even if they're the most respected and beloved teacher or leader, because remember, if that person employed grooming, that means that they're, they actually made an effort to become the most beloved teacher and, um, and leader so that they can have access. Um, you also don't want to force your child to give and receive um, affection. So, you know, I know even, you know, we, my husband does this at home. Like he, when someone comes over, oh, you know, he, he tells my son to go and hug and kiss the person that's coming. And we all do that. It's part of our culture. Um, we, we, we really want to, um, to, you know, be close to each other and show love and affection to each other. So the, the issue, though, with that is that if your child doesn't want to do, doesn't feel like doing that, it's really best to, to not force them. And I'm not saying that if they don't want to hug and kiss someone who comes in the door, that means that that person is a danger to them. Absolutely not, because we all know kids, sometimes they're shy or they just don't feel like it, and that's totally fine. But why I'm saying this here is because you want to make your child feel like it's okay for them to set a boundary. It's okay for them to say, no, I don't want to hug and kiss that person. Because God forbid, if some, at some point there is a person there that is a danger to them, you want them to feel like they can say no and that they have a right to say no. Similarly, we teach our kids to always respect and obey elders, which is obviously, you know, in general a good thing. But we also want to teach them that if they feel unsafe around someone, even if they are the most respected person in the community, that it's okay for them to also set a boundary and say, no, I don't want to be around that person. Um, and that just because they're kids doesn't mean they're any less worthy of our respect and um, or that they're any less valuable. We also tend to give, you know, cutesy names to body parts when, uh, when they're kids. Um, but, you know, and I think also because we feel like if we say those words, it's ayyib. So the problem with that, though, is that if, again, God forbid, a child were to be abused and they're going to disclose to somebody, they may not feel comfortable disclosing to you because maybe it's someone that you know, maybe it's someone in your house, maybe someone that you admire or love. They may want to disclose, you know, their friend's mom or their teacher. And they might use a word that the teacher has no idea what they're talking about. So the teacher might dismiss it, and then that's it. The child's never going to disclose again. So it's important to, um, to give the, your kids the tools to be able to advocate for themselves. Now, if your child appears distraught around a specific person, doesn't want to be alone with them, um, that's something also to take into account. Um, 
you want to talk to your child about prevention, you know, teach them that no one can touch them in certain places, that they should immediately tell if they feel uncomfortable. There's a lot of books out there, a lot of information about how to do this. Um, I saw a book the other day called C is for Consent, and it was for younger kids, so you can start that um, conversation early. You also want to be open to whatever your child wants to tell you. Um, if they say they have a secret, you don't want to dismiss it because maybe they're testing the waters to tell you something else. And this is not necessarily just about themselves. You know, maybe they saw something that's going on with another child and they, they feel like um, they want to tell somebody. And then that gives you an opportunity to really step up and, and be um, someone who's, uh, you know, protecting your community. Um, and finally, like I said, believe a child if they tell you something is going on because the cost of disbelieving really is much higher than the cost of you know, believing them and then finding out that it was not a true accusation. So this is an app that was created um, by Childhood USA with a nonprofit called Darkness to Light. Um, it's a really great app it's, um, to, about child prevention, basically, uh, child abuse prevention. Um, and it has a lot of information. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but um, it has education, organization safety checklists, um, uh, and it also, I, I believe, has uh, information on how to report child abuse. The last thing I'm going to say is about mandatory reporting. So mandatory reporting basically means um, that you know, people who are in, uh, in professions where they are always around children, they are legally um, obligated to report suspected abuse to the authorities. They have to or else they get in trouble. Um, I personally think that everybody should be a mandated, mandated reporter. I think if you suspect anything, it should be reported to the authorities. Now, um, I, the thing I, I also wanted to import here is that it could be absolutely anonymous. So no one will know that you made a report and also it's suspected abuse so it's not like you know for sure you're just reporting suspected abuse so there's some evidence that something might be going on and you want to make sure that you know that a child is safe best to report there'll be an investigation and then if nothing comes of it that's fine but you may be protecting one child or many in the community by reporting. And um, there's a website that we'll put on in Jake's clothing about um, how to report child abuse. And then these are more resources um, uh, about child abuse, just information, um, and then uh, Brother Donish's website and Jake's clothing and um, some hotlines as well that we'll have on the website. And that's it for me. Thank you very much.